So welcome. So uh, we have on stage with us um, faculty member Anthony Coleman. And I'm Hank Isnetsky, I'm Chair of Contemporary Improvisation here at New England Conservatory. And of course, John Zorn. And I wanted to start out, um, you know, today we had a uh, meeting with the composers here at the conservatory. It was wonderful. We, we never knew we had so many composers. And, uh, but one of the things that, uh, that you talked about, John, was your musical heroes. So I would love to hear about who some of those people are and if you can tell us stuff about them. We know it's just it's too many to uh, really go into. Really well, we have until so almost eight o'clock. This is way too loud. So let's okay. turn this down. Do okay. we even need this? In this oh yeah, yeah, it'll be cool. But but the monitor's too much. That's all. Okay. A few of them. Well, you mentioned a guy named Jack Smith, and I never heard of Jack Smith. He's not a musical hero. He's there we go. Yeah. He's just a hero. <laughs> I, so who is he? Is he someone involved in performance art, or what? What was that? <laughs> Shall I say anything? Okay. <laughs> There's a film called Flaming Creatures. Yes. <laughs> it divided the world into two parts, essentially. People who thought it was a masterpiece, people who thought it was the worst film ever made. What else should I say? <laughs> well, a lot of people were arrested when it was shown. Why? Uh, do we need to talk about this? No, no, we don't. You can go on to the next question. Go on to the next question. Oh, I'm going to NEC. Well, it's interesting to talk about Jack Smith and NEC, but I see your point. Okay, well, let me, okay, let me put it this way. Let me put it this way. Um, as an artist, you pay your dues. That's something that we all need to do. You've done it. Anthony's done it. Many of you out there have done it. You pay your dues. Now, what does that mean, paying your dues? It means earning it, earning the right to do what you do. You can't just get up and do it. You need to earn it first. Mm. So I paid my dues with Jack Smith. Um, Jack Smith from, I guess, the late 50s when he moved to New York um, was a bit of a legend. Um, he inspired Andy Warhol. He was in, the, in that scene for a while. He worked with Ken Jacobs. Probably none of you know. Anyone know who Ken Jacobs is? Yeah. One, two, three people. God bless you all. <laughs> right on. Um, uh, he also, I mean, there wouldn't be, uh, Richard Foreman was very much influenced uh -huh. by Jack Smith, who's a, a theatrical genius from New York, the ontological hysteric theater. Robert Wilson got a lot from Jack Smith. Uh -huh. A lot of kind of New York underground artists got a lot from the ideas of Jack Smith. Um, Jack was very extreme, very pure. He did what he did. He was always on. There was never a moment when he was not kind of performing. Uh, he lived in a small walk-up. He did shows for, you know, three people in the audience in the 60s and 70s. I saw him perform in 75 or 74. Um, at that time, it was a piece uh, based on Ibsen's Ghosts. Mm. And uh, it was called The Secret of Rented Island. Mm. And it was supposed to start at 9 o'clock at the Collation Center down in Lower Manhattan. And you'd somehow find the place. It was very hard to find it. And of course, there was no real ad. You just kind of heard about it. Oh, Jack is doing a theater piece. This is the same Jack who did Flaming Creatures in 63. And the people who showed Jonas Mikas at the anthology for Marcus were arrested for showing it. It has some controversial imagery in it. But it was filmed on outdated stock and was watermarked and beautiful and incredible. And it really, 
it, it, it inspired Warhol to start making films. It was a very influential film in the New York underground. So he moved into uh, theater pieces. And you'd somehow find the place, and there'd be no one there, just a lot of garbage on the stage. The stage really wasn't a stage, it was just a loft in one area. It was a lot of an old Christmas tree, literally, you know, junk from the street. It was just littered. Um, and, well, you waited. And then you waited. <laughs> and maybe 11 p.m., Jack would come out wandering through the set. <laughs> Oh, we have to fix this, this isn't right, we need to fix this. And he'd spend an hour kind of fixing the set. Around midnight, the show proper would begin. And it would go probably till about three or four in the morning. And this was the beginning of, you know, he'd been doing this already for several years when I saw that piece. Um, but it was the beginning of, of using time in this kind of expansive way that he did in the mm -hmm. 60s. Robert Wilson, I think, got that yeah. idea. If anyone saw, well, I don't, um, The Life and Times of Joseph Stalin, Joseph Stalin yeah. or Sigmund Freud, these are pieces that happened in the late 60s, early 70s, New York, that were, say, 12 hours long. All those kind of ideas, a lot of that came out of Jack's idea of theater. Everything went very slow, everything was very real, and after the first show, it was just me and my friend, we were the only two people in the audience. I went up to him afterwards and I said, Jack, a huge fan, that was wonderful. If there's anything I can do to help you, I would love to do it. Oh, oh, I'll come back tomorrow. I, you know, why not, please? And so I went back and then I worked with him for almost 10 years, off and on, schlepping records, he would play records in the background for his slide shows. Um, I would help him with the lighting at some of his um, filmings. And uh, the reason, this doesn't sound very remarkable yet. Um, it's a little remarkable, yeah. but it's like <laughs> the New York Underground, well, this is not so unusual. <laughs> but what was really unusual and what I waited when I was helping him with The Secret of Rent Rented Island was, what would happen when nobody showed up? What happened when nobody showed up was he did exactly what he did when mm. there were people there. He went through the entire show with no one in the audience. Amazing. This is amazing. This is amazing. This is amazing. This is amazing. And this, you know, this was who he was. This is what he did. It was very unique, it was very challenging. It turned a lot of ideas on their heads. He lived it. He was this show, he was this art. And, and I paid my dues with Jack Smith. I schlepped records around, I carried his equipment, I went up to his apartment on First Avenue and watched him make tea and show me slides. And I learned a lot about um, integrity from Jack Smith. Now he was also a very um, uh, tortured person, a difficult person as a lot of as Ken Jacobs is. They're all wonderful geniuses but they're all, all ignored and they've been damaged by society. This is something that society has done historically for hundreds of years from Van Gogh to Antonin Artaud. Uh, these are people that have such extreme ideas the society can't deal with it so they kind of push them into a place and they usually end up dying rather early in life prematurely um, without getting much recognition whatsoever um, it's sad and it can create a bitterness and it creates uh, an intensity in your head in your life um, there's a lot of pain involved so I you know paid my dues kind of soothing that helping that, learning from that, and well, now you force Here me to are. tell you who Jack Smith is. But, but it was very you. interesting. Can I, can I say something? <laughs> yeah, um, sure. But you know what this really makes me think about a lot is when, and I don't know if this is a question or more like a statement, but I remember when I was first involved with your work, 
in the late 70s, I mean, most of the concerts that I participated in in the early days or the ones that I saw were in a small space called Exotic Aquatics that was on 1 Morton Street that was below a pet store and that, you know, you could only fit, and then you could have crickets walking around in the rug, and, and the crickets were all over the place. And I, one, one thing I noticed, because I went to a bunch of concerts in those early days, where there were a small coterie of people who came, but one thing I really noticed was it was the same. It wasn't like there was never nobody, but the intensity which, with which that audience and you interacted. And the thing that I really noticed right away is, they were always there. There weren't that many of them, but they really knew that that was the place to be. And that really told me something, like, you know, the Stones and Kazanori and certain people that followed your work through the years and were always part of the world in which, and also the thing with the uh, theater of musical optics, you know, these small performances, I think at midnight, my, right? Yeah, at midnight, at midnight. just two nights ago. In the apartment, you had to sign the book, could only have how many people at a time? Six to eight. Yeah, I mean, this was an incredible thing. So there is that connection. And that continues. And that tradition continues. I and, do those and yet here we are, you know? And yet here we are. <laughs> but see, intimacy, there, we can go, there are a couple places we can go with this conversation. Yeah. We can go towards um, uh, the, the, the intensity of intimacy, um, the ability for Van Gogh to put on a small canvas something that changes the world. Now, this is something that interests me much more than some giant overblown spectacle which costs millions of dollars and to me is a vapid, empty nothing. It, it, it's, it's crushed under the weight of its own pomposity in many ways. Uh, and these kind of, you know, bigger is better spectacle, this loses the kind of humanity, the kind of humanism, the kind of intimacy, the kind of uh, something that touches you directly that I got from Jack, that I got from all the great art that I love, is not make it bigger, you know, like what, what is the, the, uh, the, the art school joke? If you have a problem with a piece, you either, well, make it bigger or put some red in it or put tits on it. <laughs> Excuse me. Big red that, tits, big yeah. red tits, on, that, that hits all the three bits. Then it's solved, <laughs> everything's cool. Make it big or whatever. So, you know, uh, so one direction we can go, and sorry, again, four letter words have hit uh, not the Gardner Museum, but no it problem. technically it's three. Okay, well, I am here, and I'm from New York. Uh, <laughs> we, can, we can go towards intimacy and the idea of reduction. All of the things you'll be seeing tonight are all small ensemble pieces. That's what I spend most of my life on. I like the idea of, of miniatures. I like reducing things and, and doing short pieces. I rarely have big, long pieces, um, not because I can't concentrate on them, although Bruckner is a problem, uh, <laughs> but because I prefer to, to really be concise, have every note have weight and meaning. And I also, I want to see small groups interacting, chamber music. I, the last thing I want is someone on stage who doesn't want to be there. I want people who are engaged. In other words, the music is not the sounds that you're hearing when you hear these pieces. That is just the platform. That is just the platform. The music are, is the people themselves, their feelings, what they're putting into it, their energy. And that's one of the things that over the course of the day, um, Hankus and Anthony have brought some remarkable musicians together to do some very challenging and difficult music where the musicians are quite naked uh, in, in, in terms of, of what they're doing on the instrument. It, there's a, a, a lot of challenge technically, uh, there's a lot of challenge emotionally, uh, it's, it's group music but it also requires a lot of focus from each and every, every player. You know, and, and what you've done is you've brought together a really beautiful group of people and what I try to do during the day is just kind of light a fire under them, just kind of torch it up, try to make it more than just notes on the page, but actual, their life experience is what should be going over the, 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 the stage lights, lights yeah, here, yeah. you know, the footlights. It, what goes to you is not just sound. Because sound is really, on its own, to me, very uninteresting. People aren't interesting to me. So I write for people. 
I don't write for instruments or sounds. And you'll see a lot of different kinds of music uh, in the next couple of hours, from oh, yeah. you know, heavy, crazy rock stuff to uh, precise classical music to uh, some jazz-influenced music to stuff that mixes it all up. Um, now, what ties all this together are the people. These musics happened because I met certain people, created a bond with them, and wrote for them. These are musicians that could do a lot of different things. And as I met rock players, I would then incorporate their language into my work. And over the course of now, you know, 30, 40 years, I've become pretty fluent in a variety of different musical languages so that I can communicate with a rock band directly, with a jazz band directly, with a classical group directly. The result is I have a very rich, fulfilling life with a lot of great people and great musicians over a, a, across a lot of different fields. Um, and I am constantly creating because I'm constantly surprising myself. I'll work on a difficult classical piece and after that, well, a little palate cleanser, let me write some tunes for a jazz band. I'll write a whole record. And then, well, let me do a rock thing now. And well, now I think I'll see if I can come up with some improv stuff that's, or write a file card piece that in incorporates all these different kinds of musicians, put different bands together. So I'm always kind of coming up with different formations. At the same time, I'm meeting new musicians all the time. Some of the musicians that you'll see tonight, um, you will see again in my work probably, because they're very remarkable players. And I, I see a player that I like and I'll watch them for sometimes 10 years mm. before I'll call them, sometimes sooner. But I watch and when I think it's right, I sign them up. But the one thing is when someone signed up to my organization, it's a lifetime hitch. <laughs> There's no like three year hitches, you're there for good. In other words, once you're in, you're in the family. You're there. And that's the other thing we can segue to from what we were saying. We can talk about intimacy, which we've talked a little mm -hmm. bit about. Yep. And then we can talk about community, Good. which is, of course, what Anthony was talking about before with that small coterie of people in uh, 1 Morton Street, Studio Henry, in the basement of this pet shop. Pet and shop? It was a pet, yeah, exa it was exotic aquatics. So the crickets would come down, and they'd always be crickets on people's tapes from uh, taping that music back then. It was like from 76 to 79? Even later, a little later. 79, a little bit later. 79 is the first gig I did with you. So, okay, yeah, yeah, so it was okay. A, so maybe it was a bit later. 81, because yeah. it was closed down by the mob. Yeah. Yep. Ah. Talk about okay. lifetime commitments. <laughs> Man, that's actually, a, it's a 60-second diversion, I'll tell you the story. It's because it's, it's safe now, although the Gambino family is still very much in uh, vogue. But it was in, the, it was in the West Village, off Bleecker Street, on Morton. And uh, that was that, that crazy guy who walked around in the bathroom. Yeah, the guy in the bathroom, exactly. The guy in the bathroom who like, <laughs> pretended he was crazy to get out of jail, you know? Um, and he was a heavy, oh, I think, in the Gambino. Yes, he was very important. I'm trying to remember his name. I forget the name, but maybe yeah. let's not mention the name. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> At any rate, you know, we did, you know, usually nobody was standing in line to see our shows. There'd be three people in and three people out, and that would be it. Um, but we hired DNA, Ardo Lindsay and Ikaway Moore and Tim Wright, on a double bill with some other band. It might have been James Chance or something. And anyway, decided to, okay, let's embrace this no wave punk thing and let's have them play in our basement. And there was a line around the block. The next day, one of those guys, like, you know, one of those guys like that. <laughs> came over and he says, all right, Johnny, so uh, we're going to put the cigarette machine right there and uh, we'll have a little bar set up oh over my here. God. And uh, The phone line was important. He was like, yeah, and I was like, you know, you're going to you're gonna have to sign up, you know, advertising our magazine. I said, what do you mean, advert? He says, yeah, you're going to sign up in the, in, the, in the newsletter. I said, well, what's that? And he pulled a piece of paper out of his, out of his pocket. And it was like a broad sheet, if you know what that is. It's one sheet, about this big. And the writing was so small, you, you couldn't even read it. There must have been a thousand ads on this sheet. Every single business 
in the West Village advertised in his little broadsheet. Little broadsheet. And he said, yeah, it's going to cost you $150 a month. <laughs> well. <laughs> so we shut the place down the next day. That's it. We'll find another place to rehearse. <laughs> the end of Studio Henry. That's how it died. Wow. wow. It's not quite like that anymore. But, but you know, it can still happen it like that. It can happen. Well, happens, you know. It happens like that in Bushwick sometimes, you know. It, it can it, happen. It does it happen. Did. Oh, yeah. yeah. It, it didn't happen at the Stone. Thanks, God. But Thanks, God. God. So... so can you talk a little bit about learning music, like when you were younger? Like, because you talk, talk. Well, we were going to talk about community. Oh, talk about community. Okay. We yeah. were. I'm still in the answering your first question. Okay, I thought you'd stop. <laughs> that <laughs> probably take us to the uh, concert. <laughs> <laughs> That's beautiful. Well, it was That's a great, great. question. Uh, community is one of the most important things. Um, that small coterie of people that were in that basement, you know, continue to yeah. work together. Yeah. We still know each other. And it's grown and grown and grown and grown. And we've supported each other and helped each other. And I've been lucky to have some successes over the course of the several decades. And when money came in, the first thing I did is, what I'm going to do with this money? And it was, well, it's here to help. Uh -huh. So that's when I started a nonprofit back in 85 or something. And that made the label possible. Like, first, I gave a lot of grants out. Um, the books, Arcana, you know, come out of that. Hips, all my Hips various, Road. Hips Road. All my various activities, you know, are all kind of run by this nonprofit, and it's all very clean, and it's all very simple. No broadsheets there, do There are no broadsheets. <laughs> Not yet, anyway. <laughs> and uh, it, it works really well. And, and, you know, without these musicians, again, music is about people, honestly, for me. It's about the people. Without people, there isn't any music. Yeah. And maybe we can segue into like some kind of, you know, internet thing. Like, let's raise awareness. If you keep stealing music off the internet, you're actually going to put us out of business. <laughs> hmm. Yeah. Or maybe we should leave that alone. <laughs> well, it's Since all of you are stealing you, music. You put it okay. out there. It's well, you know, let's, we'll leave that one alone. At some point, um, Jewish culture became important to your to what you did, and was that always the case, or was, is there something to talk no, about? No, that about was that? something that Anthony and I talked about. I talked about it with Joey Barron, um, with Rebo. It was kind of an awareness. To me, it came, uh, it came about through, uh, when you hit 40, maybe you begin to look deeper inside yourself, your roots. You know, I looked at other musicians uh, that I've been working with um, who were looking for their roots. Chad Bourne turned to country music. You know, Frizzell also, you know, moved in other directions. It's like, where are your roots? Who are you? I went to Japan and I lived there for 10 years off and on, learned a lot about the culture and ended up feeling, well, this is not mine. What no matter mine, how long you would be there, you would never, right? I could never really break through, you know? I mean, there was always kind of a wall, but more than, deeper than that, it's just like, I'm, that's not who I am. Who am I? And well, part of who I am is being a Jew. And then I looked at all the musicians that I've been working with, and a very high percentage of them were Jews. And I was like, well, let me think about that for a minute. That's interesting. And then we got together and talked about it, and we began to do something about it. And, and uh, it came out, of course, in musical ways, because that's what I do. Um, I'm interested in making music. So the Kristallnacht may have been the first piece, and it kind of touched upon that. That you really that, did. That where really I really kind of said, direction. okay, yeah. let me deal with that. Because we did it at the Munich Festival, which was the... the that was yeah. the heavy thing. That I was invited to go to Munich uh, to do a, the art project. It's something that happened in 92, I believe. Exactly, yeah. And um, Franz Abraham... So, a very still around entrepreneur, this, this, this guy, decided he wanted to hire maybe three or four artists each to do curate a day. They wouldn't just perform, but they would hire other people. Laurie Anderson did a day, um, and there were several others. Or Nick Phil, Coleman, did, or Nick a Nick Coleman did a day. That was one hell of a day. I missed that. I'm, I'm sad I missed <laughs> it. Remember? Oh, you didn't uh, miss that? Oh, man. He had that poet dressed like Shakespeare who thought he was the reincarnation of Shakespeare who was doing these prose poems. Like, wow, that was out. And then he had those, those people suspended from the ceiling by their nipples. 
<laughs> he was like in this S and M thing. I kid you not. He was in the you know, I mean, if you Lincoln open the door Center. to an artist, you really, you better be ready for something. I gotta tell you that, that's for sure. But anyway, so he gave me a day, and then I was thinking, well, let me do some cargo thing. Two days. Two well, days. first he gave yeah. me a day, yeah, yeah. and then I said, then I was in the middle of all this Jewish mishigas. I said, well, you know what? Let me do a festival of just like Jewish musicians doing their thing. I'll call Lou Reed. Uh -huh. I'll get Tim Byrne. I got John Lurie. I got John Lurie. I got all these guys. And he said, well, this is so fabulous. Let's do two days. So then we did two days. We expanded it. Kristallnacht premiered there. And I was kind of, you know, off and running. Then, you know, the label started. Radical Jewish Culture Series, you know, began with that festival, uh -huh. which was called Radical Jewish, Radical New Jewish Culture. Um, we did further festivals, I commissioned new work, we began recording, I did the Masada project after Kristallnacht, because it was like, okay, you know, enough complaining about how miserable it was, let's celebrate, you know, what yeah. we do have, and Masada was meant to celebrate, as, you know, as much as I can celebrate anything. <laughs> Jews have a problem celebrating. You know what Lenny Bruce right, they that's what Lenny Bruce said. They observe, they don't celebrate a holiday, they observe a holiday. So, you know, we do it the best we can under the circumstances. How was that? It was Good. great. <laughs> How was that, Hankus? I just want to talk, uh, I, I'd love you to talk about your experience with um, institutions that educate musicians and what you think about music education. <laughs> I mean, you, we, we, spot. we, we, the president no, here. No, no, but you know, like Tony. this morning, well, this morning, <laughs> <laughs> this morning we discovered that in fact, we were both inspired by the same composition teacher very early on in, in our, our career. Yes. And you, you worked with him in high school. I mean, so, so you were already composing at that point and he was encouraging or? Yeah, yeah. You? Well, that was it. Uh, uh, this is a, a nice out from what you asked Thank me. Thank you. Yeah, this is very, very <laughs> trying to give you one. <laughs> good out, but we can go back to that if you want. Um, we did share Leonardo Bellata as a teacher. He taught at the UN School in New York when he came to America in 62 or 63. Hmm. And um, I was like seven, eight years old, and he was my music teacher. And uh, I actually went through when my mom died, which was maybe, God, 15 years ago now. But I went through um, all these boxes, and she saved a lot of things, including all my report cards from school. And Balada always gave me an A, man. Always <laughs> gave Balada was right. I don't know what the rest of it was a mess, but Balada was always right there. He was very, very encouraging. Um, and uh, another person who was at that school was Jacques Crusill. Now that's really interesting. Which is very interesting, who was a trumpet player, who was at that time, and this is 68, 69. He was working with Anthony Braxton. He was working with um, Roscoe Mitchell. He was working with Sun Ra. He was playing in the Sun Ra band. One of the down really forgotten guys of that thing. He, he's that? amazing. He's amazing. Yeah. And I remember seeing him do a solo trumpet concert when I was maybe 15 at the UN school at one of those assemblies. Amazing. I don't know if they still have assemblies in high school where at Friday you'd like, you'd go till maybe. One o'clock, and then from one to three, you'd have an assembly where everybody sits in the same room and something happens. <laughs> and, uh, you know, like they showed Hiroshima Mon Amour, they showed Ashes and Diamonds, they showed uh, <laughs> Throne the of end. Blood. Well, I'm like 15 years old watching this. <laughs> this was some serious shit. And Jacques Percy did an assembly. And um, I'd never heard anything like it. Solo trumpet making weird sounds and I don't know what was going on and of course I'd been into you know Ives and Parch and I hadn't really listened to jazz yet at all it was mostly contemporary classical stuff um, and I wondered what how, what how did he notate this I gotta go over and take a look and I walked over to the uh, uh, music stand after the concert and I looked at it and there were just a series of symbols there was like I remember one looked like a big eye it's like a circle in it. And I, I went to Crisil, who was my... Um, my French uh, teacher. Yeah. He was my French teacher. He was also my uh, uh, advisor. And I, I said, so what, what's going on here? What is that? I was like, oh, that symbol means I put my lips on top of the mouthpiece and then make sounds. And then I looked at all the other symbols. They were kind of like graphic symbols that reminded him of 
what he wanted to do next in this piece, different extended techniques. And I thought it was very remarkable. Now, Kursil is still around. I put out, I think, a record by him on Sadek. Um, he's in Paris. He's been teaching linguistics, I think, in Martinique for the past 20 or 30 years. And uh, he wrote something in those report cards um, that I'll never forget. Because one year, uh, towards the end of my days in high school, I got very disillusioned with spoken language. I thought that it was really just a bunch of bullshit. People were lying out their asses. I, didn't fe I felt I couldn't trust anybody or anything. So I decided not to speak. And I didn't speak for a year. What? I, not many people know this. That's, <laughs> That's unbelievable. I did not speak for a year. And um, I, I wrote, wrote down or did sign language or whatever. I mean, that was Harpo Marx kind of thing, you know. But it was also a philosophical statement. I just had had it and I didn't speak for a year. And Corsil was my advisor at the time. Um, and at the end of the year, he wrote in, in my report card, he said, while I very much identify with John's suspicion of spoken language, I do believe he's taken it a bit too far. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. And there yeah. you go. Yeah. <laughs> there are many such stories. And were you already <laughs> writing? You by my therapist thought. <laughs> So how did you start writing music? Were you inspired by these people to create music, or did, you, did that happen later? You know, my, my aunt had a, a piano in her house. My grandmother had a piano in her house. These were the days, these were wonderful days, I have to tell you. Days when, if you wanted to have music in your house, you needed to learn to play an instrument. You didn't just press a button. <laughs> <laughs> You needed to learn an instrument, and everybody had a piano. And you would buy sheet music. And then maybe, you know, your sister would learn violin. And then you'd have a concert. And things would happen through learning, through discovery. Not just, boom, there it is, anything you want. But it took effort, and it became a treasure. And this is something I think we're losing in the world that I want to bring back to music, is that sense of the special, that sense of the sacred, that sense that it's a treasure, it's something to, I grew up with it as something that was, it was something to be treasured. It was something that could save your life. It saved my life, honestly. That was a place that I could, even today, it's a place I go, I can always count on it. It's always there, it's always happening. It's always a source of joy and inspiration, music, art. Um, so I began kind of diddling around on the pianos that were in my kind of family's outreach, improvising. I didn't know I was improvising. I was just diddling around. Mm. But I guess that's how it started for me. And, and then I taught myself how to write, and then I bought scores and followed along, and then Balada took me under his wing, and slowly kind of, I would say I'm more self-taught than anything else, I like to say that. I think that's a, a, a good way of learning. But I've had a variety of teachers um, that have come and gone. I still know Leonardo Bellotta, actually. He's mm. still a wonderful, sweet man and very supportive. Artists are people that need support, not criticism. All you people out there of the press, Artists need love, they need support. That's what they need. They need nurturing. And as far as, um, uh, you know, they have enough self-criticism, most of them, inside themselves. There's, there's always, there's always, don't you think, Anthony? There's always that. There's well, you, always talked that. A, you talked about a moment this afternoon when Anthony said something that, that kind of validated what you, what you did. Well, well right, you need yeah. To, yeah, you need to surround yourself with supportive people. That's, you know, a very important thing for an artist, I think. And like those people that were at our gigs yeah, way back there. They were there then. every gig, yeah. every there. You gig. know, I mean, Casanova. They didn't miss a gig. Casanova, yeah. who was one of the three people that even came to, even before Studio Henry, I was playing in my own apartment. 
and Kazanori was one of the people that was coming there, he is the guy that helps me run Sadek. I've known that guy for 40 years. Yeah. You know, it's like loyalty, belief, integrity, sacrifice. This is what makes a community work. This is what makes art deeper and more meaningful. We're not here just to shake our booty and give you a nice fun time. There's gonna be some challenges for everybody at some point this evening. And that's good, that's okay. If you don't like it, it's all right. Maybe you'll think about it a little more and come around to it, maybe you won't. But the music that I try to put out on stage with the musicians, whoever they may be, whether they're people I've known for 40 years or some of the people tonight that I've only known for a few hours, I try to get it to the point of catharsis. I try, I need, I need imagination. To, to me, great music has imagination, craft, Honesty and catharsis. Those are the four elements that I really look for, that I strive for. And you'll be surprised how few, how little music really has all of those. Mm. That's fantastic. Well, I think, I think we're going to probably leave it at that, um, unless there's some burning questions. Don't you want me to somebody... swear anymore? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we do have a mic here. Maybe we take like two no, questions. No, man, no we're not going to do that. Not, okay. The concert starts in about, about 15 minutes. Okay. <laughs>